Have you thought about the sinfulness of sin? It sounds redundant, doesn't it? But sin has a compounding effect. It makes us ashamed. It shows us to be guilty. It separates us from God. And even though we're the ones who actually sin, we even blame it on God. And we've been doing that since Adam and Eve ate the apple. Welcome to Every Last Word, a radio and internet program with Dr. Philip Ryken, teaching the whole Bible to change your whole life. We're in a series called The Message of Salvation. Over the past two weeks, we've already looked at why we need to be saved and what we need to be saved from. Today, we consider why we can't save ourselves. Phil, our text makes clear that the problem of our estrangement from God is not with God, but with us. Yeah, that's right, Mark. You know, often when people are thinking about spiritual things or wrestling with the questions of the Bible and about God and about Jesus, they assume that the problem is with God. They don't understand what's happening in the world or they're wrestling with the issues of suffering. And that's true. And we can talk about all those things. But, you know, we also have to look at it from the other point of view that God has a problem with us. And if you start looking at all the consequences of sin, you see that we're guilty before God, we're alienated from God. And this is the cause of our difficulties we have in our relationships with with God and with others, we need to understand how extensive the problem of sin really is. So what do we do about that? If we're guilty, what's the solution? Well, Mark, you've really uh, put your finger on a problem there, and that is that if we're guilty, there's nothing that we can do to remove our own guilt, and that's why we can't save ourselves. That's why we need a Savior. And of course, the Savior that God has provided for us is Jesus Christ, who through his death on the cross has paid the price of our sin and who through his resurrection has given us the hope and the promise of eternal life. And we'll see that today as we look at Isaiah 59. Thank you, Phil. Let's turn to Isaiah now and listen to God's word for us today. This week, a friend sent me a note in which, among other things, he said, It's just a sinful world, that's all. It's just a sinful world, that's all. The reason he said this was because during the week previous, his wife had been stalked by a stranger, and a close friend had died after a long, painful illness. It's just a sinful world, that's all. And I understood what he meant, I think, because during that same week, a woman just a block from our home had been raped in the middle of the night. And another man, as he walked to visit with me here at the church, had happened upon a murder in the street, just a man lying there bloody on his way into the church. And during the same week, one of my Favorite people in the whole world was diagnosed with a chronic disease. It's just a sinful world. That's all. Something has gone badly wrong with the human race. So that while we live in a world of unprecedented technological advance, we also live in a world of catastrophic moral failure. It's a world of divorce and rape and murder where people suffer and then die. And then on top of everything else, there is our own spiritual unrest. Somewhere deep down, we know that we are not what we ought to be. Indeed, that we are not really happy at all. And you see, at the root of all of our problems lies the sinfulness of sin, That rather than seeking God's glory, we seek our own glory. And sin is what makes us ashamed, for it renders us guilty in God's sight. And sin is what makes us afraid, for it alienates us from our Creator. And sin is what makes us angry, for it estranges us from one another. And sin is what makes us anxious, for it leads to suffering and finally death. It's just a sinful world. That's all. And since we are sinners living in this sinful world, what we need is salvation. 
And so the question becomes, what must we do to be saved from sin with all of its miserable consequences? Well, the people of Israel found themselves asking the same question in the days of Isaiah, who said, and this is verse 11 in our chapter, Isaiah 59, at the end of the verse, we look for deliverance, a better translation, we look for salvation, but it is far off from us. Isaiah was writing sometime after the year 700 B.C. The prophet could see that his nation was in spiritual and moral decline. Inspired by God's Spirit, he prophesied that God would punish the people for their sins by sending them into exile. Eventually, that prophecy came true for in the first two decades of the 6th century before Christ, God's people Israel were carried off to Babylon. But Isaiah's prophecy was about more than judgment. It was also about salvation. And at the end of his ministry, as we read it at the end of his book, we find Isaiah comforting God's people with the news that they would be returned from exile, that they would be restored to their land. Yet here in chapter 59, in the middle of all those promises, we still find the people wondering when and even if they will be saved. We look for salvation, they say, but it is far off from us. Well, maybe the problem, some of them thought, is that God is impotent, that his arm is too short to reach down and save us. Or perhaps God is simply indifferent, not caring whether we are saved or not. And to this very day, these are two of the reasons people refuse to glorify God. When in doubt, they blame God for their troubles. And as they consider all of the sin and suffering in the world, they conclude that God is either unable or unwilling to do anything about it. And either way, whether he can't do anything about evil or won't do anything about it, it is all God's fault. Well, as Isaiah begins to explain the message of salvation here in chapter 59, he begins by stating that the problem is not with God at all. The problem is with us. This is verse 1. Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. God is not impotent. No, his arm is long enough to save you. God is not indifferent. His ear is attentive to your cry. No, the problem is neither divine impotence nor divine indifference, but human iniquity. And Isaiah thus reaches the same diagnosis of the human condition that we have reached in the first two parts of this series of sermons, that we need to be saved Because we are sinners. And it's interesting to see that as Isaiah describes the misery of Israel's depravity, he mentions the very consequences of sin that we discovered in our studies in Genesis. First, there is guilt. Verse 3, for your hands are stained with blood, your fingers with guilt. Spiritually speaking, if not literally, we have blood on our hands. For God holds us morally accountable for the things that we have done and for the things that we have left undone. Every one of these sins places a stain on our moral record, a stain it takes a blood sacrifice to remove. Second, sin alienates us from God. It brings not only guilt but alienation. It makes us want to hide from God's holiness. It cuts off our communication with Him. As the people of Israel had discovered, they were praying for God to save them, but still they were not saved. It seemed as if God were not even listening. In fact, the wall between the holy God and his unholy people is described in these verses as similar to the separation between heaven and earth. But your iniquities, this is verse 2, have 
separated you from your God. And the Hebrew word used here for separation appears only one other place in the Old Testament. It's in Genesis chapter 1, verse 6, where it describes that permanent separation between the earth and the sky, between the waters beneath and the waters above. You see, sin introduces the same kind of barrier to our relationship with God. It separates heaven from earth. And then we are estranged from one another. This is a third consequence of our sin. In these verses, Isaiah describes a society torn apart by violence and injustice and murder and deception. The people are quick to do one another harm. Verse 7, their feet rush into sin. They are swift to shed innocent blood. And though there is crime, there is no justice, for the legal system is corrupt. No one calls for justice. No one pleads his case with integrity. The people spend their time conspiring to commit sin. Back in verse 4, they conceive trouble and give birth to evil. If the culture Isaiah describes sounds at all familiar, it is because we also live in violent, unjust, and deceptive times. And then a fourth consequence of sin, especially all the sins that we commit against one another, and that is suffering. As Isaiah considers the lost and sorry condition of his people, he takes up a lament. We find it in verse 11, we all growl like bears. We moan mournfully like doves. That is what suffering does. It has a way of reducing human beings to inarticulate groaning. And whether we growl like bears in our frustration or mourn like doves in our distress, what we are really doing is crying out for salvation. And though we often try, we can never quite forget that all our sufferings will end in death. We are like the dead, Isaiah says in verse 10. And not simply like the dead, for as sin brings guilt and as it brings alienation and estrangement and suffering, so finally it leads to death. Well, this was Israel's condition as it was Adam and Eve's condition long before, and as it is our condition this very night. Now, as God looked at the human race and its fallen condition, what did he think about it all? Well, Isaiah says that he was displeased, to say the least, as God is whenever we fail to give him the glory that he deserves. But what really appalled God was not so much his people's sin as it was this fact that there was no one to save them from their sins. And these are the key verses in the chapter. We find them at the end of verse 15, reading into verse 16. The Lord looked and was displeased that there was no justice. He saw that there was no one. He was appalled that there was no one to intervene. You see, there was no one to intercede for Israel's salvation. There was no one to serve as a mediator, bridging the gap between the holy God and his unholy people. And God was appalled by this. He had promised salvation, but there was no one to save. Not that God was surprised by this, of course, because God knows all things, but he was, in a way, dismayed by it. He has such an intense hatred of sin and such a burning compassion for his people that he is unhappy to see us unsaved. What God saw was that his people were in no condition to save themselves. In the obvious presence of sin, there was the conspicuous absence of a Savior. This was true biblically. Though Israel had often been Delivered, she had never had a savior from sin. None of the mighty men who delivered God's people from danger could save them from sin because they themselves were all sinners. Noah got drunk and naked in his tents. 
Abraham tried to get the son of promise through a rented bride. Moses struck the rock in proud anger. David was a liar and a murderer, not to mention an adulterer. The lesson we learn from the Old Testament in part is that no mere human being can save humanity from sin. Not only is it true biblically, this is also true historically. Through the many centuries since the coming of Christ, the human race has tried to improve its condition. In many ways, we have succeeded agriculturally. We have expanded our capacity to grow food from the earth artistically. We have created wonderful masterpieces of magnificent beauty. Medically, we have increased the span of human life. Scientifically, we have made great advances in our knowledge of the universe. Morally, well, morally, we are as bankrupt as we have ever been. You see, the one problem we are completely unable to solve for ourselves is the problem of our own sinful hearts. And not only is this true biblically and historically, it is true logically and therefore universally. The guilty one cannot remove his own guilt. The one who is alienated and estranged cannot reconcile himself either to God or to his neighbor. The sufferer cannot ease his own pain. And even if we could remove all the other consequences of sin, one thing we know we cannot do, and that is make ourselves immortal. Therefore, asking a sinner to save himself is like asking a man to pull himself out of his own deep pit, or a prisoner to unlock his own prison cell. Indeed, the Scripture says it is like asking a corpse to climb out of its own coffin. What man can live And not see death, asked the psalmist, or save himself from the power of the grave. You see, if it is true that human beings cannot save themselves, we can certainly say that it is not for lack of trying. Well, some people try to save themselves through religion. They participate in sacred rituals, expecting God to save them because they go to church and take the sacrament. Others try to save themselves through good works, expecting somehow to merit eternal life by loving their families and giving to charity. And although we may say that these things are good in themselves, they are not good enough for God. And the reason they are not good enough is because none of them answers the real problem of sin. Remember that sin brings guilt, real moral blame in the sight of God. And the only thing that takes guilt away is a perfect blood sacrifice. Therefore, no matter how many good things a person does, they can never compensate for even one bad sin. And if, therefore, salvation depends on our own merits, we will never be saved because we have no merit of our own. And remember, too, that apart from the work of God's Spirit, sinners don't even want to be saved. This is one of the doleful effects of having a sinful nature as we do. There is not one part of us that wants to live for God in our natural condition. In these verses, Isaiah compares our condition to a blind man trying to feel his way around a building. This is verse 10, like the blind, we grope along the wall, feeling our way like men without eyes. Even at midday, we stumble as if it were twilight. Among the strong, we are like the dead. You see, the analogy of spiritual blindness is a good one, because the problem a blind person faces is not the absence of light, but the inability to perceive it. And in the same way, the fact that we cannot save ourselves is not God's fault. No, it is our own inability. In His perfect Word, God has given us all the light that we need to see our way to Him. We are sinners. Therefore, our minds are blinded to the pure light of spiritual truth. Some people acknowledge that they cannot save themselves themselves 
but they still want to make some small contribution to their salvation at least. And so they say, at least I can do this. At least I can choose to follow God. And they believe that salvation depends on their own free choice, as if somehow in some small way they can cooperate in their own salvation. Now, the problem with this view is that we are not morally neutral. We come into this world as sinners, and in addition to blinding the mind, sin binds the will. Theologians call this the bondage of the will. It doesn't mean that we're unable to make choices. That's not what I'm saying. In fact, the Bible sometimes invites us to choose for God. Choose for yourselves whom you will serve this day. But the Bible says, whoever wishes, let him come and take the free gift of the water of life and so forth. No, what the bondage of the will does mean is that our choices are constrained by our sin. We are sinners by nature. And thus our natural disposition is to choose sin in one form or another. You might say that our liberty is enslaved by our depravity. And in particular, we cannot choose to believe the message of salvation. No, the reason we cannot come to God is because we will not. This is what Jesus meant when he said, apart from me, you can do nothing. And when he said, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And so what the Bible says is true. Whosoever will may come, but no one will in his or her natural condition, which is why God has to make us willing. Do not expect God to save you against your will. No, if you are to be saved, God will first change your will to make you willing. And so to summarize, there is nothing that you can do to save yourself. If you want the proper title for this, this is the biblical doctrine of total inability, total inability. In your sinful nature, you are both unable and unwilling to come to God. As our catechism says, you are utterly indisposed, disabled, and made opposite to all that is spiritually good. No, you see, we cannot save ourselves from our sins because we are sinners who cannot, who will not come to God on our own. We need God to do something more for us than simply to help us. We need him to save us. Now, this biblical doctrine of inability explains why Christianity is such an exclusive religion. You know, more than anything else, what offends people about the Christian faith is the claim that Jesus is the only Savior. In the words of one young man, I get real angry at these Christians who tell me that Jesus is the only way to heaven. I mean, what kind of arrogance is that? In these postmodern times, so allergic to the very notion of absolute truth, many people prefer to think that all religions are true. Think, for example, of the American filmmaker George Lucas, who said, I remember when I was 10 years old, I asked my mother, if there's only one God, why are there so many religions? I've been pondering that question ever since, and the conclusion I've come to is that all the religions are true. Not surprisingly, this kind of universalism is beginning to infect the church. The line of reasoning goes something like this. God is love, and so he must have a plan for saving everyone, but not everyone is a Christian. Therefore, God must save people through other religions. So even some theologians who identify themselves as evangelicals are promoting Jesus as the one ultimate reality who unifies all the diverse religions. So the world is a kind of spiritual supermarket full of Buddhists and Hindus and Muslims and other worshipers who are really, though they do not know it, anonymous Christians, saved by Christ, even if they don't know Christ at all. Now, there are many logical and theological problems with that kind of universalism, but the basic issue is this. What is religion supposed to do? If religion is merely a moral code or a source of spiritual guidance, 
And it's easy to see how different religions could be right, each in its own way. But you see, if religion is really about solving the problem of humanity, then it needs to explain what that problem is and how it intends to solve it. And for a religion to have any credibility at all, it has to explain what's wrong with us human beings. It has to offer us some kind of remedy. And you see, Christianity offers the true diagnosis of the human condition. We've been seeing it in these past three sermons. Nothing explains what is wrong with the world and wrong with us any better than the biblical doctrine of sin. And if what we really need is to be saved from sin, I mean, if what we need is atonement for our guilt and reconciliation to God and life after death and all the rest of it, then the only religion even worth considering is one that actually saves. So what do we find when we compare the various religions? Well, we quickly discover that Christianity is the only one that gives genuine hope to sinners who have no hope of saving themselves. Judaism and Mormonism are based on keeping the Old Testament law. Buddhism is based on seeking enlightenment. Islam is based on keeping five pillars of obedience. False Christianity in all its multiple forms is based on receiving the sacraments or performing good works. And you see, authentic Christianity is different from all the other alternatives. It's not a program for self-improvement. It's not about God helping you to help yourself. No, it's not about what you do for God at all. It's about what God has done for you in and through Jesus Christ. The mortal failure of man-based religion is that we cannot save ourselves. And when we see what other religions have to offer, we must reach the same conclusion that God reached in the days of Isaiah when he saw that there was no one, when he was appalled that there was no one to intervene. Now, if we are to be saved at all, someone else will have to do the saving. You know, Jesus Christ once tried to explain this to his disciples. Jesus told them how hard it is, indeed, how impossible it is to be saved simply by keeping God's law. His disciples were amazed at this. I mean, if a man can't be saved by doing good, they complained, who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and he said, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. And you see, that is the message of salvation, that God makes possible the impossible in our salvation. The most basic thing to understand is the thing we are trying to understand tonight, and that is that salvation is something that God does for us and not something that we do for ourselves. And we find such a clear indication of that in this passage right here in Isaiah 59, starting in verse 15. God realized that when it came to salvation, if he wanted it done right, he was going to have to do it himself. The Lord looked and was displeased. He saw that there was no one. And so his own arm worked salvation for him. His righteousness sustained him. He put on righteousness as his breastplate and the helmet of salvation on his head. He put on the garments of vengeance and wrapped himself in zeal as in a cloak. As you hear those verses, you can hear what is so striking about them, the repeated use of the third person pronoun. What role does God play in our salvation? He sees what the problem is and recognizes that we cannot save ourselves. He works salvation by the strength of his own might. He arms himself to do battle against the forces of evil. And so from beginning to end, salvation is something God accomplishes for us. The only thing that can save us is something only he can do. And that's all by himself. And notice what is surprising in these verses. And that is that God doesn't take up any weapons. No, the military gear that he dons is entirely defensive. He girds himself with a breastplate. He takes on a helmet and a cloak. 
but he carries neither sword nor spear. Do you know why that is? Well, it is because God is strong enough to win salvation without bearing any arms except his own. His own arm worked salvation for him. Even without any weapons, God is fully armed. He is the mighty champion who wins the contest for our salvation with his own bare hands. Now, everything that we've been saying tonight about our sin and about God's salvation is well summarized by the great New Testament scholar J. Gresham Machen. Machen said that the Bible presents a perfectly clear doctrine of the total inability of fallen man and the all-sufficiency of divine grace. Man, according to the Bible, is not merely sick and trespasses and sins. He is not merely in a weakened condition so that he needs divine help, but he is dead in trespasses and sins. He can do absolutely nothing to save himself, and God saves him by the gracious, sovereign act of the new birth. And Machen concludes with these words, the Bible is tremendously uncompromising in this matter of the sin of man and the grace of God. Now the fact that the Bible is so uncompromising about sin and grace should warn us that not everyone will be saved. No, although God offers the message of salvation to everyone, not everyone is willing to receive it. Isaiah himself is very clear on this point. We see it towards the end in verse 20. The Redeemer will come to Zion to those in Jacob who repent of their sins. There you have it. Redeemer is not for everyone because not everyone will have him. He is only for those who repent for their sins. Make the kind of confession that Isaiah made back in verse 12 when he said, Our offenses are many in your sight. Our sins testify against us. Our offenses are ever with us, and we acknowledge our iniquities. And you see, it only makes sense if you want to be saved. You have to admit that you need to be saved, that you need a Savior. And so anyone who wants to be saved has to say, My offenses are many, O God, against you. I acknowledge all my sins. And such repentance is not a special way of saving yourself. It's a way of admitting that you cannot save yourself. Indeed, that you can only throw yourself on the mercy of God, asking the Savior to save you. And then once you have repented in this way, the thing to do is to put your faith in Jesus Christ. The Bible teaches that salvation is found in no one else, but there is no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. No, God has offered this one and only salvation in his one and only Son. And the reason Jesus is the only Savior is because he's the only one who can save. Only Jesus atones for guilt by offering a perfect blood sacrifice on the cross. Only Jesus reconciles us to God by paying for our sins. Only Jesus grants eternal life by the power of his resurrection. And if you can show me someone else who has ever done what Jesus has done for my salvation, then I will consider calling him Savior. But until such time, I will worship only Jesus Not, I think, because I am intolerant. Not, I hope, because I am arrogant. No, but because I am a sinner in desperate need of a Savior, and Jesus is the only Savior I know. What is the message of salvation? The message of salvation is that although we cannot save ourselves from our sins, God saves us by the grace he gives in Jesus Christ. And you know, this message of salvation will last forever. We have that promise in the last verse of this passage. God tells Isaiah, My words that I have put in your mouth will not depart from your mouth or from the mouths of your children or from the mouths of their descendants from this time on and forever. In a way, that promise has been fulfilled tonight 
as it is every time someone preaches this message of salvation from sin, by grace, through faith, to the glory of God. Amen. Our Father, we give you praise that since we cannot save ourselves, that you have provided for us a Savior. And here in the quiet of this evening, we confess that perhaps for the first time or perhaps for one of many times that we are sinners in need of a Savior. And we ask that you would give us Jesus to be our Savior. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. You're listening to Every Last Word with Bible teacher Dr. Philip Ryken, a listener-supported ministry of the Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals. The Alliance exists to promote a biblical understanding and worldview, drawing upon the insight and wisdom of Reformed theologians from decades and even centuries gone by. We seek to provide Christian teaching that will equip believers to understand and meet the challenges and opportunities of our time and place. Alliance Broadcasting includes the Bible Study Hour with Dr. James Boyce, Every Last Word with Bible Teacher Dr. Philip Ryken, God's Living Word with Pastor the Rev. Richard Phillips, and Dr. Barnhouse and the Bible, featuring Donald Barnhouse. For more information on the Alliance, including a free introductory package for first-time callers, or to make a contribution, please call toll-free 1-800-488-488. Eighteen eighty-eight. Again, that's 1-800-488-1888. You can also write the Alliance at Box 2000, Philadelphia, PA, 19103. Or you can visit us online at AllianceNet.org. Ask for your free resource catalog featuring books, audio, commentaries, booklets, videos, and a wealth of other materials from outstanding Reformed teachers and theologians. Thank you again for your continued support of this ministry.